Hi artists, welcome back. Um, today, you'll first notice that I've got my leaves in the background here. I wanna get this one up closer so that you can see how I used my crayons. And also pencil, this first one I started in pencil, maybe you can see I added a hint of color to it later on. So I've got my three leaves that I finished last lesson. And now today, I want to look at some flowers as well as some cacti and some succulents so that you can see uh, more of the amazing uh, forms that, that nature takes, especially when we're talking about um, plants. It's just fabulous. We were talking about the fact that Henry wanted to be an academic artist and that this was going to be very difficult for him because he had no training. Now, Henry observed nature closely, and boy, does it show in his pictures. But there were lots of tricks that he could never learn. And I wanna show you a couple of paintings today that will emphasize that fact. For instance, in this first picture of cows, this is a sweet pastoral picture of cows grazing in a field I'm about ready to do a painting of the exact same subject. Um, notice that his cows, again, look like cartoons. But when you go back and you look at the trees, oh my gosh, leaf by leaf by leaf. Would you check out the way he has worked on those leaves? His nature is extraordinary. Here we have another one. Again, when you look at the people walking down the road, they appear to be more like cartoons than actual photo images. Remember at this time in art, realism was the goal that artists were trying to achieve. Realism, they wanted a photographic look. Henry didn't know how to make a photographic person, but look at that background. Oh my gosh, the, the plants, the trees, the color is wonderful. One more I want to show you to emphasize the problem that uh, poor Henry was having with realism. And that is a portrait he did of himself. I, the artist, look at him. He is so proud of himself as an artist. Look at him standing there in front of the quay, which is a dock. And there's a beautiful big sailing ship parked here, right along the river, which looks like concrete. Um, the first thing I want you to notice is that the people walking along next to the ship are like ants standing next to Henry. Do you see that? Isn't that funny? Look at Henry's face. Bless his heart. It's very, very simple. It is not photographic. You can see he's all dressed up in an artist costume. He's even signed his palette with his, with his name. Look at that, his thumb sticking through holding his paint plate. He's got a brush in his hand. He's wearing an artist beret and he is standing on the ground. Well, actually he's not standing on the ground class. Look carefully and notice that he looks like he's standing on tiptoe. These are the problems with not having had a, a school training, having had school training uh, to learn how to do your art. Henry never learned the trick of foreshortening. Now foreshortening is a trick that we use in art to uh, make things that are standing forward look like they're forward in the picture. <sighs> Poor Henry. He looks like he's standing on tiptoe. He's not quite on the ground. When you look at that balloon in the background, balloons were a brand new invention. People in Paris were riding around in balloons. This was, and Henry was trying to show how modern he was, but the balloon is more like a grayish blob in the sky. Although the sky is pretty remarkable. Yes, poor Henry. He was doing his very best, but because he didn't know the tricks, it was very difficult for him to make things look realistic. Now, here's the problem. Every year in Paris, there were many shows, 
but there was one show each other that was each year that was so important. Every artist in Paris wanted to partis participate. And Henry would do these beautiful paintings and take them down. Well, he didn't even get in the door. They took one look at his pictures, they laughed at him, and they said, Henry, take it home. Now, this was very frustrating for Henry. He wanted to be an academic artist, and yet every time he went down to enter a painting in the academic shows, they just laughed at him and told him to go home. Now, that didn't stop Henry. Henry just went home and painted another one and took another one back. At this time in Paris, there was a new group of artists. They were kind of breaking the rules. And we all notice, know that um, in art, it's important to break the rules. You have to know the rules. But once you know the rules, feel free to break them anytime. Now, this artist that was breaking the rules was a group of artists known as the Impressionist Painters. And these are still today probably our most favorite group of artists in history. The Impressionist painters said, well, it's not important to really give every detail in a picture. We really just want to give you an impression of what these, these things we saw were. After all, the camera has been invented. And I've told you this before, the camera ruined art. Up until the invention of the camera, it was the job of an artist, the job of an artist to make real. If your parents wanted a picture of you and how cute you are, they had to go to an artist to get it. There were no school pictures. But once the camera was developed, suddenly, ah, why pay an artist? I can just take a photograph, click. Now, artists were suddenly out of a job. But of course, don't forget, they've still got that amazing imagination. And so they began to change how they looked at art. And one of the first things that happened was Impressionism. And in Impressionism, as I said, artists didn't worry about making things exactly real. Well, this sounds like it's working in Henry's favor, doesn't it? Except that Henry's impressions were a little too childlike for most of the impressionistic artists. They didn't like them. Now, the impressionists got very upset because guess what? The academics wouldn't let their paintings into the show either. So the impressionists got together as a group and they said, look, this is ridiculous. Let's just have our own show. And so the impressionists put on their own shows. And every time Henry brought a painting down, he was excluded. They told him to go home. His work was just too childlike for them. In fact, there's a, a, a French word that describes childlike, and it's called naive. Naive means that whatever you're talking about is a very childlike interpretation. And when they looked at Henry's paintings, they said, your pictures are too naive, Henry. And little did they know that they were actually giving a name to a new kind of painting. Which, of course, doesn't help Henry at all. He can't get his picture in any show. He worked really hard, class. And he became very frustrated. And so he tried to do something... Well, let me just tell you what he did. He wanted to put a painting into the Impressionistic shows. And he had this idea for a painting. And he worked really, really hard on it. And the painting is known as Surprise. The painting looks like this. And in this painting, oh my God, you can see the best of what Henry does. Look at all those leaves. We've been looking at these leaves. We've been looking at flowers. Look at the way he puts them together into this forest. And look at this tiger. He looks like he is running scared, surprised by perhaps the lightning that is flashing in the sky. Can you see the rain in this picture? Yeah, Henry's done a good job of showing us rain. However, 
Henry was having a heck of a time making that tiger. Look at that tiger. That tiger has feet. Henry never did learn how to make hands and feet. Henry always had a problem with hands and feet. We're going to be telling you more about that. Here he is painting this pretty amazing looking tiger for Henry. In fact, the tiger was so amazing that when he took it down to the Impressionist show, they said, yeah, well, okay, Henry, we'll hang it up. And Henry managed to get into an art show. He was so excited. It didn't even matter to him that they hung it at the highest part of the room, clear at the top, right next to the ceiling, where it was difficult to see. There was only one problem with this painting class, and it's the one time you can get in trouble when you make your art. We all know that copying is fine, right? You can copy anybody in art. Artists copy each other all the time. And I'm not just talking about painters. We were watching a wonderful music uh, documentary the other night, and they were talking about how one musician copies another musician. Artists copy each other. You copy ideas. If somebody copies one of your pictures, instead of getting mad and complaining to the teacher, turn around and say, thank you to the person who copied you. They're paying you a compliment. It's okay to copy in art, but there is one thing you can do that will get you in trouble. Yep, tracing. Now we all trace every once in a while. I even trace once in a while. But the problem is, if you trace somebody else's work, and then you say, I did this all by myself, is that the truth? When you copy, it's obviously yours. But when you trace somebody else's work, that is not being honest. Henry needed that tiger, and he needed that tiger to be perfect. So, he got a children's book with a tiger in it. And he took that tiger and he put it on a very special machine that copied the picture, that made the picture, oh, I can't even remember what you call it, but there's the image sitting on his canvas. And then he traced around that image. He traced it. And then he painted that picture. If you trace an image, it is not truly yours. Henry traced it, and then the mistake he made was putting it into the art show. This is my work. I did it all by myself. And here's where the problem came. One of the people walking through the art show stopped dead in their tracks and looked at that painting and looked at that painting and said, Wait a minute! There's something wrong here. That tiger is in my child's book. And sure enough, she was able to produce the book and show that the exact same tiger was in the book. Henry's picture was taken down from the wall and Henry was not allowed to show that painting again anywhere. It's okay to copy, but you may not trace. Now today we're going to do something a little fun. I think it's a little fun. We'll see how it works out. I've gone around to my garden and I've taken some videos of flowers. Today I want you looking at flowers. We're building, we're building, we're going to get there. We're going to make a jungle. In fact, next time, I think we might start looking at Henry's jungles. I think we're ready. Today we're going to look at flowers in my garden. I've done some little videos which I'm going to embed into this video so that you can look at flowers. And I want you, after you've looked at my flowers, to go out, walk around in your garden down the street and look at other flowers and draw those flowers and color those flowers. Now, in this instance, if you have colored pencils, they work great. But I'm going to try using some of my markers to see if I can make some beautiful flowers with markers. I might even try using markers and colored pencils. We're going to look at my flowers. You're going to look at your flowers. Please don't pick anyone's flowers without permission. All right? Sit and look at them, but don't pick them unless the, the person who, to whom they belong says it's okay. 
Oh, I have another question for you. There are a lot of dandelions growing out there and they've got yellow flowers. Do you consider them worthy of drawing? Of course. A weed is only a flower growing in the wrong place. So if you see some nice looking weeds, draw those too. We can't have too many different kinds of plants and flowers in our pictures. Now you also might want to look for some interesting leaves. There are leaves with many, many colors. I haven't even shown you uh, half of what's in my garden. And you might want to take a look at just the leaves. Or do you have some cacti to look at? Do you have some succulents to look at? Maybe you want to draw some of those succulents. Next time we meet, I want you to have three flowers or a combination of flowers and plants or cacti or leaves. Next time I'm hoping, well, next time I'm hoping to have a surprise. I don't want to tell you what it is yet. We'll see you then. Keep making art. I can't wait to see what you're doing. Thank you. Bye. Look at the patterns in these um, canna leaves. Even the brown parts are interesting, aren't they? And how about cute little geraniums? We see them everywhere. Here's another Cymbidium orchid. I have many of these beautiful Cymbidium orchids. Here's one. Here's another cacti. This one's called shark skin. Check out agave peri. This is a succulent. Actually, it's a cacti. But then, of course, cacti and succulent belong to the same family. Who doesn't love roses? Oh my goodness, I have so many. These are just a few. Now we're looking at a group of succulent plants. I want you to see how many forms and colors these succulents come in. Don't you love the snowball flowers? with pink roses next to them. That's actually called a snowball viburnum. In this picture, you are looking at a warlock, rhododendron, up in the top of the right-hand corner, and some lovely azaleas surrounding it. And here's another beautiful clematis vine flower. Here's a lovely clematis vine flower. Isn't it beautiful? The orange flower at the very top and the pink flower at the bottom are both abutilon flowers, otherwise known as flowering maples. Can you see that plant in the background that's kind of sticking up out of the pot? That's a staghorn fern. Here we have some Chinese ground orchids. And below them, we have some little tiny rain lilies. These flowers are called Astromeria. Look at all the freckles they have. Look at this beautiful bearded, German bearded iris. I waited four years for this to bloom. Here we have a red rhododendron with, if you look carefully, you'll see my favorite purple heart leaves in the background. These are sun azaleas and next to them you will see a beautiful purple clematis flower.